America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neofusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of neofusionism. Neofusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. Today, we will be looking at a book called The Enlightenment, The Rise of Modern Paganism, and that's written by Peter Gay and published in 1966. So I'm reviewing this book because I want to take a closer look at The Enlightenment, which we've uh, touched on briefly in a few in a pre- few of our previous books. Uh, we had mentioned John Locke as uh, sort of the person who opened up the Enlightenment thought, and uh, uh, Edmund Burke uh, as sort of the closing bookend of the Enlightenment. So that's from uh, around around 1680s to 1780s, 1790s, that sort of approximate century we'll call the Enlightenment. Um, and the Enlightenment sort of acted as the catalyst for modernity. Uh, most of the of the ideas that we now consider modern, uh, our dedication to science, primarily our, our dedication to individual freedoms, uh, the modern West, liberal democracy, much of these concepts really came to the fore in the Enlightenment. Um, they may not have dominated society during the Enlightenment, especially not at the beginning, but by the end, they did, in large part. And so we're going to look a little bit closer at that. Some of the ideas of the Enlightenment went into founding the, uh, the, the founding documents of the United States of America. Our Constitution, Declaration of Independence, these draw on Enlightenment ideas, and many of the founding fathers were well-read on Enlightenment thinkers um, who had been writing for about you know, the previous hundred years when the U.S. Constitution was first written. And so one of the main concepts of the Enlightenment, and let me just say there are a number of threads of ideas that run through the Enlightenment that aren't all always in agreement. Uh, we've seen in the last book we saw the Enlightenment described uh, through John through uh, John Locke as an example. We saw the Enlightenment described as a somewhat Aristotelian uh, era, and it has also been described as more of a, a less empiricist and more of a rationalistic. Era, and we'll look at some books in the future that are going to approach it a little bit more from that direction. Now, we're not going to dwell on the Enlightenment for book after book after book, uh, but other other books are going to mention it in various contexts just because of its importance. This book uh, is the one that in, that focuses specifically on the Enlightenment, um, and this book doesn't really take a the approach of viewing it as specifically. Aristotelian or Platonic, but I would say that on the whole, it tends to tends more toward the Aristotelian approach in that it views the Enlightenment as a as a a rise of empirical science, uh, but more so it's 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 both because it's reason and rationality um, and empirical observation. The two the two of those combine to form uh, the the rational scientific approach to reality that is first embodied in the Enlightenment. So uh, the Enlightenment thinkers really saw themselves as bringing about a new era in many ways that was opposed to the previous superstitious era. But they did look back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans as inspiration uh, for their uh, quest. And this book is called the, Ri- the Enlightenment, The Rise of Modern Paganism, because specifically, not because pagan superstition or pagan virtues necessarily became prominent, because I, I don't think that they did during the Enlightenment, maybe to, to some extent, but primarily it's about a, a, a turn back to 
to a quest for reason and rationality that we see in both Plato and Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers and many of the ancient Roman philosophers, although obviously worship of the gods was very widespread in ancient Greece and ancient Rome. There was an undercurrent in philosophy at that time of uh, reason and rationality and the importance of those things. So I'm going to start reading here as I do in all of my reviews. I'm going to read some sections of this book to you and provide some commentary afterward. And once again, there are huge sections of this that I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read much about when he gets more specific with the conflict between Christianity and uh, the Enlightenment. I'm going to read more, a few of the earlier sections, um, just providing some basic outlines. And then he talks a little bit about the concept of uh, criticism, cultural criticism that becomes so prominent in the Enlightenment. I want to have a few words to say about that after I read those sections. But first, just a section here in the beginning that kind of lays the framework for the his, the how the philosophes, as they were called, of the Enlightenment viewed their position within history. And so the author says, quote, With all their passion for history, the philosophes' vision of the past was remarkably pessimistic. History was a register of crimes, a tale of cruelty and cunning, at best the record of unremitting conflict. All was not black. Each age, each civilization had its defenders of the oppressed, its champions of reason and humanity. Diderot's bleak essay on the reigns of Claudius and Nero pits courageous Stoics against superstitious tyrants. Hume finds a minority of sensible men in the midst of darkest medieval England. In general, barbarism and religion had dominated the past, but a few glorious ages testified to the possibility that reason might not merely be the critic, but the master of civilization. It is possible to explain this pessimism as a projection of the philosopher's own situation, as a mixture of self-pity and self-importance, which exaggerates the difficulties of their position to enhance the significance of their achievement. But it was more than that. It was a coherent account of the motive power both within and among epics. As the Enlightenment saw it, the world was and had always been divided between ascetic, superstitious enemies of the flesh and men who affirmed life, the body, knowledge, and generosity between myth-makers and realists, priests and philosophers. Heinrich Hein, wayward son of the Enlightenment, would later call these parties most suggestively Hebrews and Hellenes. This conflict between two irreconcilable patterns of life, thought and feeling, divided historical periods internally. It also divided them from one another. Each era had a dominant style, with either reason or superstition in control. But the philosophes insisted that this dominance was merely the temporary ascendancy of one combatant over the other. Few periods in history were without their admixture of reason or superstition. The darkest, most primitive ages had their philosophers. The most brilliant ages of reason and cultivation were infected by the survivals of old or the seeds of new superstitions. This is what Voltaire meant when he said that the 18th century was both the age of philosophy and the age of superstition. It gives new meaning to Kant's observation that his age was the age of enlightenment, but not an enlightened age. The conflict between Hebrews and Hellenes was at once the source of disaster and of progress. This dualist view of history, rather than the celebrated theory of progress, characterizes the mind of the enlightenment. The theory of progress was a special case of this dualism. It gave formal expression to the hope that the alternations between ages of philosophy and ages of belief were not inescapable, that man was not forever trapped on the treadmill of historical cycles. Philosophical sociology and philosophical history supported and confirmed each other. Both studied the conflict between reason and unreason. The first sought laws that might decide the struggle. The second traced its courses through the ages. In fact, the philosophes developed a kind of comparative history, which they explicitly distinguished from the study of the past for its own sake. This history, first practiced by Montesquieu, later explored by Scottish sociologists like Adam Ferguson, and finally christened theoretical or conjectural history, 
was sociology. But whatever history the Enlightenment historians pursued, they focused their attention on the rise and decline of the philosophic party on the fortunes of criticism. The Enlightenment's conception of history as a continuing struggle between two types of mentality implies a general scheme of periodization. The philosophes divided the past roughly into four great epochs, the great river civilizations of the Near East, ancient Greece and Rome, the Christian millennium, and modern times, beginning with the revival of letters. These four epochs were rhythmically related to each other. The first and third were paired off as ages of myth, belief, and superstition, while the second and fourth were ages of rationality, science, and enlightenment. I should observe immediately that the philosophes did not propose this scheme as a rigid system. They recognized the stubborn individuality of cultures and the continuities that link the most disparate ages. The arts and sciences indeed, David Hume remarked, have flourished in one period and have decayed in another, but we may observe that at the time when they rose to greatest perfection among one people, they were perhaps totally unknown to all the neighboring nations. Some philosophes called attention to the autonomous development of Eastern civilizations. Voltaire, partly in calculated rebellion against Bossuet's narrow vision of the past, partly in unfeigned awe of Oriental sagacity, opened his essay on the manners and spirit of nations with some appreciative passages on the civilizations of the Indians and the Chinese. Others, like Condorcet, musing on the uneven development of social classes and neighboring cultures in their own time, sympathetically described the plight of contemporary savages who seemed to have undergone little significant historical development, and of the lower orders which remained much like their ancestors in the darkest of dark ages. Besides, Despite some extravagant epithets, the most fanatical anti-Christians among the philosophes did not claim that the two pairs of ages matched precisely. They conceded that the Christian millennium was more rational and more civilized than the early civilizations, just as they took pride in the superiority of their own time over Greece and Rome. But while the philosophes themselves sensibly insisted on these variations, the exceptions they adduced did not invalidate their general scheme. They wrote the history of the human mind as the history of its rise, from myth in classical antiquity, its disastrous decline under Christianity, and its glorious rebirth. In one manner or another, whether expressed in the prophetic fervor of Condorcet or the ironic detachment of Hume, the scheme dominates philosophical history. The famous first chapter of Voltaire's the age of Louis the Fourteenth specifies four happy ages, the centuries of Pericles and Plato, and of Caesar and Cicero, which correspond to what I shall call the first age of criticism, and the ages of the Medician Renaissance and of Louis the Fourteenth, which constitute the prehistory of the Enlightenment. These happy periods are embedded in two ages of belief, which Voltaire dismisses with superb disdain as miserable, vicious and backward, end quote. So there you can see pretty, uh, pretty clearly a contrast that the philosophes drew between ages of uh, enlightenment or reason, rationality, science, um, humanity, compassion, and in contrasting those ages of superstition, mythology, brutality, darkness. It's kind of a very clear and almost uh, highly exaggerated contrast here. Um, but we can get an idea of their hostility toward, uh, the, toward the reigning Christian dogma of their time and also an example of how and perhaps why they drew such parallels between themselves and the ancient Greeks and Romans. So uh, that kind of frames the whole book right there. And then the book goes into a lot of particular details about a lot of particular people. Um, it's it's absolutely jam-packed with facts. Um, I want to read a section where he talks about, in particular, a, a poet from ancient Rome by the name of Lucretius. And this seems like a pretty interesting fellow. We don't really know much about him. Uh, but he was he he was a poet in ancient Rome who spoke 
against uh, the mythology and superstition of the time and was in favor of the science of the time, which, you know, in ancient Rome, science was not extremely developed, uh, but there was still uh, there was still a quest for knowledge and a quest for truth and understanding of nature. And Lucretius wrote a, a long poem called On the Nature of Things. In, in, and that's, I think, the only thing that he wrote, or the only thing he wrote that survives, but it's very well known and very well respected, especially among the philosophes of the time. So uh, I'm going to read a little bit here about Lucretius. I think that provides a nice, a nice example of the connection that they saw between themselves and the ancient world. So he says, quote, The philosophes, two most reliable sources of inspiration in Roman literature, the two writers to whom they could turn with confidence, certain of finding in them support for their great enterprise, were the greatest poet and the greatest publicist of the late Republic, Lucretius and Cicero. Titus Lucretius Carus is a mysterious and shadowy figure, although the men of the Enlightenment found themselves completely at home in his On the Nature of Things, that poetic rendering of the most unpoetic of philosophies, Epicureanism. They read it often and quoted it to the purpose. Voltaire had at least six editions and translations in his library, and the other philosophes collected him just as assiduously. Yet they had no way of visualizing Lucretius the man. None of his letters have survived, and while his ideas and style pervade the writings of his contemporaries, they quoted him without acknowledgment and passed him over in silence. There has been much puzzlement over this science, and it is the other favorite of the philosophes, Cicero, who at least provides a clue. In a private letter written in 54 BC, Cicero tells his brother that Lucretius's On the Nature of Things is constructed with craftsmanship and marked by flashes of genius. Ten years later, in a disingenuous aside in the Tusculan Disputations, Cicero implies that he does not know the poem. Since Cicero was a courageous man, his reason for the denial must reflect a political position. Lucretius was to the dying Roman Republic much what Hobbes was to the 17th century, a disturber of the peace, whose work was too great to be ignored, but whose name was too disreputable to be praised. A poet who uses the word religion in the pejorative sense in which others used the word superstition was dangerous. Whatever the circumstances of Lucretius's life, the meaning of his poem was as clear to his readers in Cicero's Rome as it was to his readers in Voltaire's France or Frederick's Prussia. One famous tribute from no less a man than Virgil makes this plain. Happy the man who can know the causes of things and has trampled underfoot all fears, inexorable fate, and the clamor of greedy hell. What makes this apostrophe significant is that Virgil links knowledge of causes with the conquest of fear, a coupling which is the essence of the critical mentality at work. Science, and science alone, pitilessly destroying myths, brings the greatest of freedoms, inner peace. This is Lucretius's message and mission, and this is how the philosophes read him. On the Nature of Things is a fierce polemic animated by the fanatical single-mindedness of the man with the cause. No propagandist ever conducted the battle of science against religion more exuberantly than Lucretius, nor won it for science with such simple means. In all forms but one, he argues, religion is merely superstition based on ignorance and maintained by terror. Science, by contrast, is right reason, offering a complete and coherent account of the universe, the one sensible religion, the Epicurean doctrine of the passionless gods dwelling in serene indifference in the heavens, does not interfere with true, that is, Epicurean, science. Men must banish fear, and they banish it by banishing religion, and they will banish religion once they understand science. Thus, Lucretius admonishes Memmius, to whom he addresses the poem, urging him to listen to true reason and glimpse a natural order free from the terrors of religion. Lucretius has often been called the poet of nature. It is true that On the Nature of Things celebrates the natural world for its own sake. Rarely has so much poetical power 
been expended on so improbable a collection of subjects. The relation of mind to body, the rise of civilization from primitive beginnings, the sexual urge, the weather, the growth and decay of the body, earthquakes, volcanoes, and burial rites. But Lucretius's grasp on his single subject, his obsessive preoccupation with the enemy religion, never weakens. All this natural science, he announces near the beginning, is needed to free Memmius from the bloodthirsty fairy tales of the priests. Prophets, he writes, frighten believers with tales of eternal punishment. Therefore, men must learn the laws that govern the sky and the earth. This argument has a curiously modern sound. It anticipates the positivist views that the more physics, astronomy, geology, and anthropology we know, the smaller the swamp of unreason. It anticipates Diderot's assertion that the advance of philosophy entails the retreat of religion. Lucretius is aware of the utilitarian direction that scientific exposition takes. To admire the heavens, or to marvel at the rhythm of sexual appetite or the beauty of landscape, is one thing, but to know nature, and he insists on this, is something more aggressive than the cultivation of aesthetic sensibilities. Knowledge is intellectual, it is rational, objective, scientific, and it is even more than this, it is an instrument of social reconstruction. This is the meaning of the verses which appear in Book One and are repeated several times in the poem for emphasis, verses the philosophes liked to remember. This dread and darkness of the mind, therefore, need not the rays of the sun, the bright darts of day, only knowledge of nature's forms dispels them. There is some incoherence in On the Nature of Things, especially in Books 4-6, to six, and some of the church fathers later seized on this to impute to Lucretius fits of insanity, but most of the time Lucretius is masterfully in control of his material, so that the incongruities of the later books suggest a corrupt manuscript and a poem left unrevised at the time of the poet's death. Lucretius resembles a composer enamored of a musical phrase, toying with it, concealing it, bringing it to prominence when he feels it is time to hear it again. On the Nature of Things is a set of variations on a theme congenial to the skeptical mind in all times and all places. Such are the heights of evil that religion can urge. This motif dominates strategic places in the poem. It is first stated at the beginning of Book One, announcing the purpose of the work, and restated at the beginnings of the other five books. It appears as an invocation to Epicurus, the godlike Greek who first dared to defy the powers of superstition and to bring men the gift of freedom. It appears as a proud declaration of the poet, intoxicated with his task. Quote, I continue to loosen the hold of religion on men's minds. In Book 3, the best known, the assault on religion reaches a powerful crescendo. Voltaire promised to translate it, but never kept this engagement. Frederick the Great took it to battle with him and, with his heavy-handed humor, liked to call it his breviary. Lucretius here gives a materialistic account of mind and body, continually interrupting his scientific exposition with programmatic declarations and ending the book with the most celebrated passage in the whole epic, an exalted declamation against the fear of death. Lucretius was awake to the paradox haunting his assault on all accepted forms of worship. If religion is so pernicious, if it drives men to greed and barbarous cruelty, why is it so widespread? If the Epicurean solution of the religious problem is man's only cure for this oppressive curse, why is it so unpopular? Rather grimly, Lucretius concedes that he is offering bitter medicine to a patient as unreasonable as grievously sick men often are. The resistance of his patient, however, only demonstrated the need for Lucretius's prescription. It was a function of ignorance. This is the conclusion to which he points his analysis on the origin of religion in Book 5. Men had visions of deities, and in their ignorance equipped them with all desirable characteristics lacking in poor mortal men. In ignorance, men attributed the regularities observed in nature to the labor of gods. In ignorance, men converted their own helplessness into religious awe. Only science can cure this pervasive disease. 
on the nature of things ends as it had begun. In Book Six, The Last, Lucretius once again reminds his reader of his mission and repeats the familiar verses. Quote, this dread and darkness of the mind therefore requires not the rays of the sun, the bright darts of day, only knowledge of nature's form dispels them. End quote. The appeal of such ideas and such rhetoric for the Enlightenment is easy to understand. It is hardly surprising that the philosophes liked to quote Lucretius's verses, invoke his support, and imagine themselves to be his reincarnation. The image of bringing light into darkness, which pervades on the nature of things, is aged, conventional, and by no means confined to anti-religious propaganda. Plato was fond of it. Primitive priests and Christian church fathers identified their cult with the luminosity of the sun, the ritual with the conquest of dark powers by the illumination of mystical insight. But Lucretius's version of the metaphor was particularly congenial to the philosophes. When Lucretius spoke of dispelling light, lifting shadows, or clarifying ideas, he meant the conquest of religion by science. That is precisely how the philosophes used the metaphor. In fact, they used it so freely that the metaphorical basis of their words was forgotten. They claimed to bring an age of light. They called their movement an Aufklärung, an Illuminismo, an Enlightenment. Pope borrowed the image of light bringing for his famous couplet about Newton. Diderot used it with casual familiarity in the encyclopedia to claim the growth of light and the decrease of shadows for his century, while Voltaire made it serve for both illumination and warmth in a single complimentary phrase, quote, the light which illuminates his mind, he wrote about Diderot, warms his heart. The very triteness of the language is an index to the ease with which philosophes could associate themselves with Lucretius, another light bringer. End quote. So I find that kind of remarkable that a uh, a poet from the Roman Republic, so you're talking, you know, before the birth of Christ, uh, would be so adamant about religion being a cloud on the mind and that true knowledge of nature, science, essentially, was the cure to this superstition. I mean, this is so this is not just a modern idea, although it maybe has only come to prominence in the modern era, uh, but this idea has been around for a very long time. And I find that very interesting. So now I want to move into uh, another chapter called The Climate of Criticism. And we're going to talk in some future uh, upcoming books a little bit more about criticism uh, and even a criticism of criticism, if you will. Uh, but I want to introduce it here. And essentially the author is, is stating that criticism is the key to understanding truth and that criticism was a core component of the Enlightenment and Enlightenment philosophy, to leave everything open and available to be criticized. Uh, so let me start uh, by reading this section here, provide a few comments. He says, quote, The Enlightenment's definition of philosophy, the organized habit of criticism, does not correspond to the traditional definition. On one side, it was latitudinarian, it promoted confidence that goodwill, clear thinking, and unremitting hostility to superstition were, on the whole, adequate equipment for the philosopher. On the other side, but for the same reason, the philosopher's definition was narrow in the extreme. It banished verbal play or system-making from the true province of thought. We keep coming back to it. For the Enlightenment, the age of philosophy was also, and mainly, the age of criticism. These two names did not merely designate allied activities. They were synonyms, different expressions, as Ernst Kasserer has said, of the same situation, intended to characterize from diverse angles the fundamental intellectual energy which permeates this era and to which it owes its great trends of thought. This energy was the drive for knowledge and control, a restless Faustian dissatisfaction with mere surfaces or mere passivity. Its favorite instrument was analysis, 
its essential atmosphere, freedom, its goal, reality. For all their brave talk about their need to destroy the wild beasts of superstition, talk that soon gave rise to the charge that the Enlightenment was merely negative, the philosophes did not sharply separate their work into tearing down and building up. Both were inescapably linked parts of the same activity. The Enlightenment joined to a degree scarcely ever achieved before the critical with the productive function and converted the one directly into the other. It is this exalted conception of criticism that led Lessing to prefer the search for truth, that is, the unremitting and unending exercise of criticism, to its possession, and this is why Gibbon could endow it with the most desirable qualities. All that men have been, he wrote, all that genius has created, all that reason has weighed, all that labor has gathered up, all this is the business of criticism. Intellectual precision, ingenuity, penetration are all necessary to exercise it properly. To be this kind of critic clearly made one into something more than a wrecker, something better than a complainer. It is with such arguments that the philosophes tried to substantiate their claim that they were philosophers. Yet their reiterated, almost plaintive self-defense suggests some uncertainty. Established elites do not trouble to justify themselves. It also suggests that their claim did not go unchallenged. Now and again, Kant noted in his Critique of Pure Reason, we hear complaints about the shallowness of the mentality of our age and the decline of solid science. But, he rejoined, I do not see that those sciences whose foundations are secure, like mathematics, physics, etc., in the least deserve this reproach. On the contrary, they retain their former repute for solidity, and as far as physics is concerned, they even surpass it. Our age, he emphatically con concluded, is the very age of criticism. We may agree that Kant's defense is valid, but it remains true that the philosophes invited skepticism by their manner. I have already mentioned their touchiness, their lack of distance from themselves, and, indeed, their language was redolent with metaphors of battle and the physical act of penetration. They spoke of the beam that pierces corners of darkness, that blow the level barriers of censorship, the fresh wind that lifts the veil of religious authority, the surgical knife that cuts away the accumulation of tradition, the eye that sees through the disguise of political mystery mongers. To tear the mask from error is to establish truth, wrote, wrote Falconet, sculptor and philosoph, in the approved tone. We must cut off by the roots a tree that has always borne poisons, wrote Voltaire, who enjoyed the role of the embattled champion. Obscurity, indeed, is painful to the mind as well as to the eye, but to bring light from obscurity by whatever labor must needs be delightful and rejoicing, wrote Hume in his more moderate accents, turning from metaphors of aggression to another metaphor whose popularity in the Enlightenment I have already noted, the metaphor of light. The age of criticism was not always criticizing. End outer quote. So, uh, you can basically see that the, that the philosophes of the Enlightenment equated criticism with philosophy and essentially saw the two to be the same thing. Um, and there's a sort of defense embedded in there that, uh, that their criticism is not merely tearing down, but also building. That is something that I think could be questioned. I think that there's, there's, a danger that we've seen in some previous works in tearing things down uh, with the supposition that you are capable of providing something effective to replace those things which you've torn down. Um, to, to have a single generation, I mean, not that the, the Enlightenment lasted a single generation, but, um, but, but each even single person within this group sort of attempts to dismantle uh, the the superstitions and religions and traditions of the past. And it can spread from just saying, well, okay, this, this belief, this superstitious belief is not factually accurate. And that can spread to say this tradition, which is built upon this uh, superstitious belief, therefore 
has no function uh, and and if a if say Christianity it runs all through Western civilization as it did for hundreds and hundreds of years every corner of Western civilization uh, is touched by Christianity then you have to be very careful if you're going to cut Christianity out of Western civilization that the remaining structure is not so weak it can't stand on its own. That's a danger uh, that we see and that's something that I'm going to talk about in some future books. Now this is a challenging scenario because I have always tended personally to think that everything should be subject to criticism. There should be nothing that is simply off limits and to some degree the modern uh, political correctness that we see so thoroughly filling our modern discourse and pushed so heavily by uh, by the left, the modern left, is largely an attempt to shield different groups and ideas from criticism. That to even criticize or question components of the modern leftist agenda is hate speech or is in itself a call to fascism or whatever. I mean, you know, the, the rhetoric just gets so over the top sometimes. I, I don't even know if I should dignify it by discussing it. But uh, to, to criticize the left's agenda immediately puts you in a, in a, a very uh, disregarded and disreputed category. Uh, of xenophobic or racist, sexist, whatever other qualifiers you want to add on to that, just to say, well, is the, is, the, is the left's agenda really the correct agenda? Now, as you probably know, if you've been listening to the podcast at all, um, I'm not a believer in superstition. I'm very much a materialist. I'm a determinist. I believe in a very ex extremely controlled cause and effect uh, reality, cause and effect based reality. And, and I don't believe that there's anything in this world that is supernatural or unnatural or what have you. It's all materialistic and it's all perfectly natural. And so, you know, there's, you know, pretty much everything in Christianity that asserts itself as being you know, factually accurate. I'm not talking necessarily about virtues or or aesthetics or anything like that, uh, normative claims. But but I mean like objective claims that this happened, that the that the uh, the creation story happened, the story of the flood happened, the uh, resurrection of Christ happened. You know that God exists. All these things as being objectively true, I question. I doubt. I don't believe it. But I do recognize that from a from a sort of utilitarian perspective, you have to be cautious about how much damage you're willing to do to beliefs that undergird our entire civilization. If you're not willing to let our civilization crash and burn, then you need to be careful when you chop the foundations out from under it. Um, you need to be... You know they say that they're that they're building as much as they're destroying, but um, you better be certain about that, and you better be certain that what you build is solid enough to hold up the things that are no longer being held up by that which you've destroyed. So that's my that's my kind of commentary on that. Um, and there are future books, like I said, that we'll be reading in the near future that are going to address this again, because I think it's it's an important. It's an important concept when we when we talk about how we deal with tradition in our society and how we deal with change and political change, the sort of thing that we've kind of touched on when we looked at Edmund Burke. Anyway, let me keep reading here uh, some more about uh, some more about the concept of criticism. He says, "Outer quote, receptive to antique winds of doctrine as they blew across the centuries, yet resistant to any single school." The philosophes found eclecticism, the school that denied being a school, the mode of thinking that gave their informality and their desire for action the most generous room for play. They liked to borrow from eclectics above all, and they chose their models eclectically. This, for the Enlightenment, was the triumph of criticism over theory, the symbol of its intellectual independence. 
Among all the aspects of the Enlightenment's eclecticism, this is the most remarkable. It was not embarrassed, but exultant. It was exhibited, not as a last resort or as a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy, but as an appropriate, in fact, the most appropriate, style of philosophizing. Diderot expressed the convictions of all the philosophes when he denied that an eclectic is merely a lazy syncretist who collects bits of philosophy from a convenient assortment of ideas. Rather, the eclectic preaches and practices autonomy. He is, quote, a philosopher who tramples underfoot prejudices, tradition, antiquity, universal assent, authority, in a word, everything that overawes the mass of minds, who dares to think for himself, to go back to the clearest general principles, examine them, discuss them, admit nothing save on the testimony of his experience and his reasoning, end quote. Here, in the guise of an appreciative article on the eclectics in the Roman Empire, is a virtual self-portrait of the 18th century philosoph. Ironically, this declaration of philosophical independence was largely a plagiarism. The article Eclecticism was freely adapted from Brucker's History of Philosophy. But since Diderot took only what suited him and added his characteristic touches, his very borrowing becomes an exhibit in eclectic procedure. From all the philosophies he has analyzed, Diderot writes, almost as though to disarm criticism of his own proceedings, the eclectic makes a philosophy for himself, individual and personal, one that is his own. That is why modern eclectics, critical of all systems, are critical even of their intellectual ancestors. The philosophes agreed that the ancient philosophers, even at their best, had showed the way to the promised land without entering it themselves. Consider, David Hume wrote, quote, the blind submission of the ancient philosophers to the several masters in each school and you will be convinced that little good could be expected from a hundred centuries of such servile philosophy. Even the eclectics, who arose about the age of Augustus, notwithstanding their professing to choose freely what pleased them from every different sect, were yet, in the main, as slavish and dependent as any of their brethren, since they sought for truth not in nature, but in the several schools, where they supposed they must necessarily be found." though not united in a body, yet dispersed in parts. The very fall of ancient systems during the revival of learning had taught modern philosophers the value of independence. To seek truth, not in nature, but in an antiquity of their own, as the eclectics had done, violated Hume's sense of proper philosophic procedure, as, of course, it violated that of the other philosophes. Hume's strictures are far too sweeping, they even misrepresent his own manner of reading the ancients. As we well know, neither Hume nor any of the other philosophes learned from antiquity only what to avoid. His words are the words of an apt and ungrateful pupil. When it came to individual favorites, Hume, like the others, was inclined to discover a philosophical vigor denied to what he liked to call the sects. The most honored and the most quoted among the eclectic company was inevitably Cicero. Cicero's dialogues allowed the philosophes to treat ancient doctrines as ideal types, sharply delineated, and to pit these types against each other in free and candid combat. We love to read the books of the ancients, Montesquieu noted, to see the prejudices of others. The road to autonomy was lit by these debates, for the harsh light that the criticisms of each school cast upon the others tested the strength and exposed the weaknesses of all. End outer quote. Okay, so that's kind of a uh, section that talks about eclecticism, uh, which was an ancient philosophy that essentially said that bits and pieces of all the different ancient schools of thought, you know, Epicureanism and Stoicism, um, the, the teachings of Plato and those of Aristotle and the skeptics and the cynics, etc., etc., these different ancient schools of philosophy, each of them had a little bit of... Uh, of, of the truth, of wisdom in them, and they could be all examined and, and put together to form a, a truer, better philosophy. I like that. Uh, I, I guess I see myself kind of as an eclectic in a way. Um, I'm clearly in this podcast. I'm going through all these books of different schools of thought and different people and different eras, trying to dig out these nuggets within them 
um, you know, focusing on in on certain chapters and ideas and disregarding other sections of the books that I'm reading uh, in order to piece together these ideas. I, I, I can see that and I can follow in their footsteps. And at the same time, I can see the the criticism that even in doing that, you're still following a sort of dogma in the sense that you've limited yourself to only particular, especially the criticism that Hume uh, makes of the of the uh, eclectics, that they would continually only look to other people's previously generated ideas rather than generating their own or rather than looking to nature, to study nature, to to arrive at the truth, instead just studying other people's theories. Um, I guess the criticism is is valid, um, but I think there's also you know when you're when you're looking at other these other people's schools of thought, there is value in all of those, and they can be um, bit by bit taken and put together. And maybe there there must be also original thought and original analysis. I'm not a scientist. I can't engage in, you know, psychological research. Um, my options available to me are other people's uh, writings and then my own musings and contemplations so that, you know, I've got some ideas of my own that I don't think are really put out there, but I can find enough of a sliver of this or that idea that if I patch them together, I can make a picture that's wholly new. And so that's, I think, what I try to do, and that's what the philosophes of the Enlightenment tried to do. They looked to the ancient philosophers, just as I have and will um, more extensively in the future look to some of the ancient philosophers of Greece and Rome, and, and I've been looking at Aristotle, if you've been following along at all, and I'm looking to the Enlightenment. So I think it's a valid, I think this eclecticism is a perfectly valid approach, um, and and one that I find kind of near to my heart. Uh, so anyway, that's that's that that I wanted to read there. And then lastly, this is a bit of a longer section, and this comes back to more more uh, examination of criticism. I'll provide a few comments after I'm done with this section here. Uh, he says, "Quote: The philosophes were realists in that they took the material for their activity from the concrete experience of daily existence." and continually returned to that existence for refreshment and confirmation. The philosophes who founded the United States and wrote its great apologetic documents appealed to experience on almost every page, and their European brethren admired them for it. The Enlightenment's realism did not take the depressing form that marks so much later realism. The philosophes delighted too much in social and aesthetic refinement to equate reality with sordidness. The rich were as real to them as the poor. But far from disdaining ordinary things, the philosophes found their world among them. They were not too fastidious to seek the laws of political economy, legal institutions, and human motivation, or to describe the travails of the unlettered and the careers of the middle orders. The mixture of styles that invaded their plays, stories, and novels cannot be exhaustively explained as a reflection of bourgeois values. It embodies the philosophes' conviction that reality must be sought in workshops as much as in salons, in introspection much more than in metaphysical ratiocination, and in the commercial relations of traders rather than in the imaginary history of the social contract. Some of the philosophes' most intense thinking and most passionate activity was occasioned by ordinary events. Voltaire converted himself into a tireless critic of the French legal system when he was nearly 70, as a result of hearing about the execution of Jean Collas. Their literature, too, is the imaginative transfiguration of the real, perhaps not more so than most other literature, but certainly not less so. Lessing's and Diderot's plays, Weiland's novels, attempt realistic, individualized, truthful, and morally relevant portraits. Weiland, as Goethe beautifully put it, early educated himself in those ideal regions in which youth likes so much to dwell, but since they were despoiled for him by what is called experience, by encounters with world and women, he threw himself onto the side of the real and pleased himself and others in the combat of the two worlds, where, in light skirmish, 
between jest and earnest, his talent showed itself at its finest. The philosopher's attack on fancy was not an attack on imagination, but on thought ungrounded in life. I call the Enlightenment's realism moral, because whatever channel of expression it used, anti-clerical mockery or political polemics, its vital center was a moral vision of the world. The truth I love, wrote Rousseau in 1761, in harmony on this point with all the other philosophes, is not so much metaphysical as moral. Most men of the Enlightenment had outgrown the naive hope that the truth makes men free automatically. The pursuit and conquest of truth had moral dimensions for them. Kant, who argued that any lie, whatever, is wrong, was not alone in holding that the truth by itself is a good. Other philosophes, like Voltaire, who lied incessantly, agreed with him. Yet the philosophes were all too painfully aware that a man who knows the truth may not act on it, that inconvenient information is likely to be suppressed, that, in short, knowledge and morality are not always allies. As Diderot put it in one of his moments of moral ecstasy, If there is a God, he cares a great deal more for the purity of our souls than for the truth of our opinions. In fact, it was precisely their awareness of this disjunction, a disjunction often merely nasty but sometimes tragic, that made the philosophes preach so much. Their single-minded concern for morality was the source of most of their con anti-intellectualism, and intolerance of opposition. But it also gave their philosophizing vigor and point. They knew they were concentrating on what was important. In the rhetoric of the Enlightenment, this concentration on essentials took the form of a rather complacent claim to practicality. Even Rousseau, whom all but his most infatuated disciples dismissed as an unworldly dreamer, insisted that true knowledge is practical knowledge. It is not a question of knowing what is, he wrote in Emily, but only what is useful. And he made young Emily grow up among things, not books. This claim, coupled with the assertion that their thought was a form of action, does the philosophes less than justice. Clearly, the sort of action congenial or even possible to each of them depended not only on his country and his generation, but on his character as well. Gibbon, tried to do little more than to amuse and instruct a select circle of educated men and women, most of whom were probably unbelievers even before they read The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Polemicists like Condorcet, on the other hand, tried to do nothing less than to make a revolution in politics, economics, and social relations. The philosophes' action ranged from Adam Smith's theoretical lectures on politics and Lessing's lyrical advocacy of toleration to Holbach's fierce anti-Christianity and Voltaire's frenetic campaign against the infamous. Besides, practicality does not characterize all of the philosophes' activity. Not all philosophes were encyclopedists trying to change the general way of thinking, and the encyclopedists were not encyclopedists all the time. Many of Diderot's inventions, Hume's essays on taste, Lessing's philological controversies, Voltaire's neoclassical tragedies, were free from any conceivable utility, except the importance of giving gratification to the writer and pleasure to the reader. After all, as I have said before, the philosophes even practiced certain forms of metaphysical speculation for pleasure. As stylists and classicists, as playwrights, art critics, and poets, they were saved from being Philistines by their very cultivation. They were far too interested in letters and in art, and indeed in sheer thinking as such, to follow out their methodological prescriptions to their rather dreary conclusions. On one side, then, the practical philosophes often took a holiday from practicality. On the other hand, they practiced it in a special way. After all, in itself, the claim to practicality in no way differentiates the Enlightenment from other ages. While there have always been speculative minds happy to proclaim that their work had no relevance whatever to anything outside itself, in general, philosophers have defined what they are doing as useful, and useful precisely because they are doing it. The claim to being practical is one of the traditional debating points in Western civilization, 
when the church fathers called their theology the only practical philosophy because pagans were too busy quibbling to attend to serious business, they were using a polemical device that they had taken over from their classical opponents. When Bacon and Descartes, and later the philosophes, criticized the scholastics for contentious learning, they too were adopting the weapons of their enemies. As experienced polemicists, the philosophes, I think, would not have been surprised had they known that their successors would ridicule them as system-makers, shallow rationalists, and impractical dreamers, for being, in a word, the very utopians they had taken care not to be. He goes on to say, quote, This conversion of philosophy into disciplined aggression against concrete problems marks an epoch in the history of the human will. The mythopoeic mind is caught in a violent oscillation, it swings erratically from extreme confidence to extreme despair. By ritual and magical practices, the man in the world of myth controls his environment with fantastic power. He kills enemies far beyond his reach, guarantees bountiful harvests, or secures a male succession. His faith moves mountains. But his glorious sense of mastery has its counterpart, the abject sense of impotence. Evil, unseen forces, or incomprehensible divine wrath, destroy labor, thwart hopes, and nullify even the most meticulous religious observance. For such powers, the mythopoic mind knows no sure remedy and has no rational explanation. It turns to surrender or propitiation, humble submission or grim sacrifice. From the vantage point of the Enlightenment, unsympathetic as it was to the refinements of theology, it appeared as if the higher religions had done little to mitigate the swing of this pendulum of emotions. Some theologians seemed to claim that man could be certain of salvation or damnation, others that he must remain forever uncertain, but all agreed on man's abject dependence. Even those who argued that man's conduct bore some relation to his fate did not liberate him from the grasp of superstitious elation or despair. In the same manner, the higher pseudosciences left man as helpless as before, the vast aspirations of the alchemists wholly unrelated to experience, and the ambitious predictions of the astrologers offered dramatic instances of a fancied impotence, which proved again and again to be a delusion. The philosophes were confident that their scientific empiricism alone could lead to a realistic appraisal of man's place and possibilities. Man is unhappy only because he does not know nature. This is the opening sentence of Holbach's System of Nature. Man's mind, Holbach continues, is infected with prejudice, his intellect crippled by false opinion. To make things worse, man tries to break out of his proper sphere and rush beyond the visible world. Even repeated and cruel disasters have not cured him of his mad enterprise. He despises realities to meditate on chimeras, neglects experience to indulge in systems and conjectures, dares not cultivate his reason, and makes claims for knowing his way about the imagery, and makes claims for knowing his way about the imaginary regions of another life, instead of trying to make himself happy in his own dwelling place. In a word, man disdains the study of nature to run after phantoms, and leaves the straight path of truth which alone can make him happy. In this paragraph, the Enlightenment's moral realism is summed up in passionate words and workmanlike logic. Only philosophical modesty brings intellectual results. Only rational, that is, scientific, inquiry brings happiness. Like the philosophers of antiquity, therefore, the philosophes found it impossible to separate their inquiries into nature from their inquiries into morality, and their inquiries into morality from their inquiries into human nature. Control of the outside world and the inner man depended on a rational understanding of both, and this understanding in turn depended on a clear definition of the sphere, in fact of the very nature of action. Whatever the universal unchanging component of man's nature, that nature defined itself for its time and its culture through its particular activity. The philosophes generally tied to the rhetoric of natural law, did not put it quite so simply, but they came to recognize that man is what he does, and comes to know what he is by discovering himself in action.
I love wisdom and evidence, wrote Diderot, like the athlete in the arena. The strong man recognizes himself only on the occasions that he has to show his power. In myth, man's ignorance of himself and his world is veiled by extravagance. Man feigns self-knowledge by drawing plausible but false inferences. What the philosophes rather harshly called the destruction of superstition was the unmasking of these inferences. The critical mind took it upon itself to show that the course of the stars has no influence on human lives, or that a few words or gestures do not alter the regular rhythms of nature. In magical thinking, mind is inhabited by a demon, and the world is constantly, bewilderingly alive. In philosophy, the demon is exercised, and the confusion is reduced to law. Magical thinking is an ever-repeated yet ever-futile attempt to control anxiety-producing situations. The control exercised by scientific thinking acts to remove the very sources of the anxiety itself. The mythopoic mind is crippled by what Freud has called the omnipotence of thought and by its opposite, wretched dependence. The critical mind, on the contrary, seeks to establish the supremacy of the ego against the blind drive of the id and the harsh denials of the superego. The enhanced feeling of self, which seems to express itself in the magical worldview, indicates actually that at this stage there is, as yet, no true self. Through the magical omnipotence of the will, the I seeks to seize upon all things and bend them to its purpose. But precisely in this attempt, it shows itself still totally dominated, totally possessed by things. Science escapes this projection of hopes and fears upon the world by its controlled method methodical objectivity. It understands that all true freedom of action presupposes an inner limitation, a recognition of certain objective limits of action. It was precisely the failure to seek these limits, which proved to the philosophes that most metaphysics was merely a higher form of myth-making. That was neither a generous nor even a just appraisal, but it explains why the philosophes found it necessary to deride Descartes for boasting that he could construct the universe with matter and movement, and similar claims by other metaphysicians. These boasts struck them as fine specimens of the omnipotence of thought. Paradoxically, and that is why the Enlightenment is a stage in the history of the will, the philosopher's manner of philosophizing increased man's power by mitigating his claims. This is what Bacon, and after him, the Enlightenment, meant by saying that we master nature by obeying her. End outer quote. So that's a, that's a pretty deep section there. Um, so what, are, what is he saying? Well, essentially he's trying to lay out a case that the Enlightenment thinkers, or the philosophes, considered themselves to be realists, that their concern was for um, the real world. And so they believed that their actions, their their philosophizing, was, was an attempt to uh, fix problems in the real world, to attain control over the real world. And there's also, he talks about a separation between knowledge and morality, that, that simply knowing is not the path to, is not, is not the ultimate good. Knowledge is not the ultimate good. Now, when we looked at last episode, Plato and Aristotle, Plato had argued that knowledge was the ultimate good, that knowledge of the good, uh, was the, was the, the goal to which men should aspire. And Aristotle said, actually, good behavior is the, is the goal to which we should aspire. Knowledge of, of the good is important, uh, but for ordinary people, you know, we can't, we can't necessarily reach a perfect knowledge of the good, and we got to do the best we can by cultivating good habits. That was kind of Aristotle's idea. This does follow along those lines, in separating knowledge from morality. So I, I, I do find it interesting how we, we kind of get back to this same uh, dispute between idealism and realism with the, uh, the Enlightenment thinkers squarely attempting to come down on the side of realism, although nowadays, oftentimes, we, we look back at the ideas of the Enlightenment thinkers and we see a bit of idealism 
hidden within it the like the notion that that pure rationality and reason uh, can free humanity. They they say that uh, that it's that there's a separation between morality and knowledge, and yet a lot, a lot of times I don't know as though that really is all that accurate. And I also think it's interesting how toward the end of that section he talks about how the unscientific mind or the mythopoic mind oscillates between two concepts. One is believing that they have this ultimate power over nature, that they can, um, you know, cast these magical abilities, whether it's, whether it's um, appeasing the gods or, or uh, casting some sort of a spell or ritual or whatever to guarantee uh, effects in the world. But it's undergirded by a, a, an impotence that ultimately it all comes down to the power of God or the power of the gods. Um, and, that, and, and that mankind only has what power is given to him by the gods. And then in the very last section, uh, he talks about how the, uh, the philosophes found that understanding limits of human action uh, and, and human capacity that we have the we have the capability uh, we have the capacity to do things but we don't have the capacity to do all things and there and and understanding our limits is a necessary component to uh, believing in science as the adequate method for affecting the world because there are things that we simply cannot do without greater knowledge so in the end the enlightenment presents us with a pretty complex set of characters and set of ideas. I think there are a lot of internal contradictions. Uh, I, I do think that uh, there's, a, there's a certain sort of idealism that comes out of the Enlightenment that we, that we can... It's just such a dedication to the scientific idea that we can understand the world. The world is understandable. Um, and the dedication to reason and rationality as being our guide, our guides for how we're going to build our world and how we should build our world because we can understand things uh, in a more accurate way than, than is postulated by superstition. But that becomes taken so far that it becomes the case that every single idea, every single institution um, has to continually justify itself through reason and rationality, and there is no room left for simply um, allowing things to continue on the basis of tradition. And so, while I do support the quest of reason and rationality, and particularly you know empirical observation and and rational conclusions drawn from such, there has to be a recognition of human limits. Uh, and there has to be the recognition that that you may not personally understand everything about the world, but that you shouldn't assume that you do, or you shouldn't assume that you can, given you the current level of technology or the current level of science. Uh, we make these proclamations uh, that don't necessarily have a basis in reality because we don't really understand like why you know why people do what they do how societies work we don't always understand particularly when it comes to the human mind it's so the human mind is so complex we don't entirely understand it and um to throw out everything that is not rooted in empirical knowledge and understanding when it comes to human behavior hu empirical knowledge and understanding is only a sliver of of the real situation of of how we behave and why. We simply don't understand much of human behavior. We understand more today, but especially in, in the Enlightenment, I mean, you're talking in the 1700s, our understanding of, of human nature, our, our scientific understanding of human nature was just barely scratching the surface. Everything we knew about human nature was, it was based on, on observation and conjecture, but there was a certain there was a certain notion that there's that's just the way people are that's just the way things are 
we couldn't we could we could observe and say people behave this way but if we couldn't explain why they behave that way or we couldn't prove that they behave that way in every instance or or in most instances or what have you i mean just the the level of concrete evidence that could be used to to explain individual people and societies as a whole was so sparse uh, that I think it become it became dangerous to expect every institution and every common belief to have to justify itself or be swept aside. I think that was a that was a dangerous uh, over reliance on individual rationality and a dangerous dismissal of the wisdom embedded in tradition as. Edmund Burke spoke about, and so while I do support much of the uh, much of the ideals and direction of the Enlightenment, it's also unleashed, you know, it's un it's unleashed modernity and a whole host of problems that come with a with modernity, because we've tried to shape we've tried to shape society, we've tried to rebuild society, and haven't just allowed society society to exist and to build itself. Um, slowly and through repetition of ritual and traditions, and we and 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 the 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 attempt to understand and conquer nature, to dismantle nature, to learn its secrets, is it, it's rooted in the idea that there is no such thing as knowledge that we shouldn't have. All knowledge should, you know, should be available to us. While they may not have stated that knowledge is always the same thing as morality, I think that a lot of them behaved that way. Uh, then there was never the notion that maybe there's some things we are better off not knowing. And even today, we still very rarely will you find someone who will say that there are things we're better off not knowing. But we face humanity faces the possibility i mean we invented the nuclear bomb less than 100 years ago and we we already used it very soon after inventing it we already lived under the constant threat of mutually assured destruction and you know it may just be a stroke of luck that we didn't destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons so is it possible that we simply don't have the maturity and the wisdom as a species to handle nuclear weapons. Is that a possibility? Do we face catastrophic climate destruction? I believe yes, we do. That seems to be uh, the the consensus of of scientists that our environment is being radically degraded. We're losing countless species to extinction. Uh, whether it's on account of climate change or simple degradation of and destruction of natural environments, you know, cutting down the rainforests and all of the species and animals that are lost in that, all of the nature that is lost and, and you know, may not come back adequately or in the same way that it was. I mean, we don't really know. Again, I don't really know. We don't really know what the long-term effects of some of these things are. And so we open up science as a, as a, a thing that we basically consider always good. It's always good to know more. Um, and I know people who basically think that, that knowledge of truth is the highest thing we should attain, strive toward. But that's short-sighted to me. There's other things like survival of us and and the survival of the environment upon which depend we depend that is more important than knowledge and and it's arrogant to say that there's no amount of there's no knowledge that we should not have maybe there's some knowledge that we just can't handle like i mean just to throw out a simple example you know if you have a gun in a safe and you have a combination lock. Do you give your kid the key to the combination lock? Your your ta your five year old. Do you give them the the code to get into the safe to get the gun? No, 
because they're not old enough to have that knowledge. They're not old enough to have that information. They're not capable of knowing the combination to the safe. And and they can't be trusted with that information. You love them. You love your kids. But you can't trust them with that information. They don't have the wisdom and maturity. Okay, well, yeah, but what about adults? That's kids. What about adults? Okay, well, let's take ISIS, for example. Or even Iran or whomever. But let's take ISIS. Do you want ISIS to have the knowledge of how to build a nuclear weapon? Well, maybe not. Maybe we don't want ISIS to have that information because we don't trust them to use that information wisely. And Iran or North Korea or what have you. Maybe there are regimes that we don't trust with that knowledge. Those are adults, but we don't think they have the wisdom or maturity to uh, have that information and be responsible with it. Right? But what about ourselves? Do you think it's possible that there might be something that even we as Americans, some knowledge that we should not have, you know, then it starts to seem almost inconceivable because we want power and knowledge is power and we're afraid that someone else might have that knowledge and so we need to have that knowledge too before someone else gets it and uses it against us. But that's, is that, is that the strongest case for knowledge? Like as a species, is there thing, are there things that maybe we as a species should not know? Would we as a species be better off if we hadn't developed the capacity for nuclear weapons? I don't know. I mean, we lived through thousands of years of superstition. And maybe people suffered under superstition. Maybe people died under superstition. But superstition was not on the verge of catastrophically destroying the planet. Okay? Superstition was not going to annihilate the planet with nuclear bombs and was not going to annihilate the planet with climate catastrophe. Only science did that. Only science unlocked those, uh, only science unlocked that Pandora's box and gave us those, those powerful tools that, with which we may wind up destroying ourselves. So think about that. Anyway, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent here, but the Enlightenment is a mixed bag, suffice to say. And modernity itself is a mixed bag. And so in the ne the upcoming uh, episodes, I'm going to look at some of the responses to the Enlightenment. Next episode, I'll look at Romanticism. Uh, and so some of, some of the criticisms of modernity and, and the Enlightenment are, are in the pipeline. I'm going to wrap this up now. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, you can check me out on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, pretty easy to find. Search for Neo Fusionist. I'm also on Patreon, and I appreciate any support that you might be willing to give to help me continue to explore the various ins and outs and uh, challenges and opportunities of building a bridge between conservatism and particularly paleoconservatism with a naturalism and a a naturalistic science-based understanding of the nature of reality and naturalistic philosophy and some other side streets that I will most certainly be going down. Uh, I think it's fun and informative, and if you agree, then please help me out on Patreon. So that's going to wrap up this episode. Tune in next time for some info on romanticism. Thanks, and see you next time.